Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Sulphur Industry. We have discussed until now a uh, few details about the production process of uh, fuel and industrial gases because they are very much essential almost all uh, chemical industries whether in organic chemical industries or organic chemical industries. Right? So, now uh, from today's lecture onwards what we are going to see? We are going to discuss production of different types of inorganic chemicals. Okay? So, before going into the uh, sulphur industry details, we have a few uh, comparison of uh, inorganic chemical technology against the organic chemical technology, inorganic chemical industries. Compared to organic processes, inorganic processes are simpler and can be easily developed because these are usually one or two uh, single step reactions. Usually organic reactions if you uh, take so many complicated uh, intermediate and then intermediate steps are there before getting into the products etc. But coming to the inorganic chemical reactions, inorganic chemical processes they are very simple. Mostly uh, they are one or two simple step reactions only. Then mostly there are no side reactions and then even if there are side reactions whatever the byproducts etc. are there, they are also uh, considered as a kind of a uh, product. For example, if you take a, a zinc or copper smelting process, in those processes in such metallurgical industrial processes what happens large amount of H2SO4 is produced. So, obviously, uh, H2SO4 is very important from a chemical industry point of view. Uh, that it cannot be discarded. It has to be considered as a byproduct and then uh, it should be recovered after uh, required purification etc. Because H2SO4 is a kind of barometer to measure the development of the chemical industries in general. Right? So, that is what happens in most of the inorganic chemical industries. There may not be by, uh, there may not be side reactions. Even if there are side reactions, there would be some uh, byproducts etc. And these are irreversible for maximum yields and almost no danger of thermal decomposition. If you take a, a organic components, majority of organic components uh, they are thermal and they get thermally decomposed even it is uh, uh, moderately higher temperature like 60, 70 degree centigrade something like that because their boiling points may be lesser and then such kind of problems are not there in case of a majority of the in inorganic chemical products. So, these are the some of the Comparisons are advantages of inorganic chemical industries if you compare with the organic chemical industries. Okay? If uh, so many uh, advantages are there compared to the organic processes, then why not the inorganic uh, uh, industry is dominating over the organic industry in general. Obviously, inorganic chemical industry is also used, but organic chemical industries are dominating in overall chemical industry processes. That is because concerned to this uh, inorganic chemical industries, the main problem is that getting raw materials. Most of the raw materials uh, required for majority of the inorganic chemical production in India are imported from other countries. Most of the raw materials required for the uh, production of majority of inorganic chemicals are often imported from the other countries. Right? So, that is one concern because of that one you know inorganic chemical industry is not dominating over organic chemical industry. So, obviously, if you do not have raw material sufficiently pure then uh, getting good yields of refined organic chemical products uh, may not become uh, much economically feasible. So, making them uh, first of all get, getting these raw material from the uh, other countries and then uh, making them to produce inorganic chemicals uh, with economical uh, yield etc. is further uh, challenge for chemical engineers in general. Also unit processes of inorganic chemical industry are relatively simple, this is another advantage. Like if you take neutralization, calcination, sulfonation, nitration etc., these, these reactions occur in simple kind of reactors. Uh, you know simple batch reactor etc. one can take and then a simple CSTR reactor one can take and then do these things. So, then what is the role of uh, uh, chemical engineers in inorganic chemical industry? It is to decide the sequence of unit operations to produce high purity chemicals with economic yield. This is very important because raw materials you are getting from the other countries, especially for India the there is a shortage of uh, uh, raw materials uh, for the production of inorganic chemicals. 
So, the problems associated with the raw materials availability would be discussed whenever we are going to discuss about a particular industry. So, for example, today we are going to discuss about the sulphur industry. So, we are going to see the difficulty of availability of sulphur raw materials or raw materials to produce elemental sulphur in India, uh, you know those things we are going to discuss now. So, in sulphur industry let us start discussing about the sulphur. As we have seen for the production of fuel and industrial gases until now, the similar pattern of uh, uh, lecture we are going to follow that is we are going to see pertinent properties of a given chemical that we are going to produce and then uh, what are the uh, quantitative uh, requirements etc., raw materials, reactions associated, uh, different types of uh, processes available or uh, different flow charts that are available for the production of uh, given chemical along with them uh, associated major engineering problems and economics we are going to discuss. So, for the sulphur if you see the properties chemical formula is S, atomic weight is 32.07. Coming to the melting point if it is available in uh, rhombic crystal form then 112.8 degree centigrade, if it is available in monoclinic crystals form then 119 degree centigrade is the melting point. Boiling point is 444.6 degree centigrade and then coming to the specific gravity for rhombic crystals it is 2.07 whereas for monoclinic form it is 1.96 whereas the liquid form it has 1.803 specific gravity. It is insoluble in water but soluble in ammonia and other types of organic solvents. It exists in different forms like in rock form, in the lumps form, in the molten form, in the ground powder form and in sublimed powder form as well. It is available in different forms in general. Then consumption pattern if you see you will be surprised to know that more than 90 percent of the elemental sulphur that is produced in India is used for sulfuric acid production. So, primarily elemental sulphur is produced for the production of sulfuric, sulfuric acid. So, obviously wherever there is a possibility of producing sulfuric acid uh, as a byproduct, it is better to recover them and then uh, store them as a kind of uh, useful byproducts like as I mentioned zinc and copper smelting processes. Because even from the elemental sulphur, 90 percent of the elemental sulphur whatever we are having, we are utilizing for production of uh, sulfuric acid. Up to 90 percent of sulphur containing raw materials are converted to the following commercial oxidized form like sulphur dioxide, sulphur trioxide, sulfuric acid and oleum. The sulphur dioxide is further oxidized to sulphur trioxide before making the sulphuric acid, right. So, um, even sulphur dioxide, sulphur trioxide are also further being utilized for uh, making sulphuric acid, right. Oleum, uh, is a uh, different form of sulfuric acid where it is a mixture of sulfuric acid and sulfur trioxide. Let us say if it is 20 percent oleum means what does it mean? If you have 100 kgs of oleum then out of 100 kgs of oleum 80 kgs should be H2SO4 and then remaining 20 kgs should be SO3, sulfur trioxide, okay. End uses of elemental sulfur are many but uh, however primarily up to 90 percent of elemental sulphur used for sulphuric acid manufacturing. And then sulphuric acid is as I mentioned already it is a kind of barometer to measure the growth of a chemical industry. Presently the production as well as the consumption pattern of H2SO4 if you see in India and compare with USA then India is on par uh, with the United States of America. Rest of the elemental sulphur is used for the production of sulphur dioxide, sulphur trioxide, carbon disulphide and potassium pentasulphide. These are further used for other kind of inorganic uh, chemical productions also. Then rubber vulcanization agents for that purpose also ele elemental sulphur is used, gunpowder, sulphur dyes making, putties, sulphur concrete etc. for these purposes also the elemental sulphur is used and then it is also used in paper and pulp manufacturing. Now let us see availability of raw materials for production of elemental sulphur in India. Sulphur deposits in India are existing only in Puga Valley of Kashmir and then we know 
terrain conditions are very difficult in uh, Kashmir Valley. So, mining uh, this elemental uh, sulphur or sulphur deposits from the Puga valleys is not going to be economically feasible. So, what are the alternative sources of recovering elemental sulphur or sulphuric acid? We are not only talking just about recovering elemental uh, sulphur, but also sulphuric acid because we understand even if elemental sulphur if you recover by uh, other alternative processes, 90 percent of is, this is going to be used for the production of sulphuric acid. That is the reason in a process uh, rather el recovering elemental sulphur if you are directly recovering or you know producing sulphuric acid as a by production it is even better. So, what are such kind of alternatives that is what we are going to see now. Recovery of elemental sulphur from petroleum refineries. In petroleum refineries often this elemental uh, sulphur is available. Then production of byproduct sulphuric acid from zinc and copper smelting processes. Then production of sulphuric acid from pyrites. Okay? So, Recovery of elemental sulphur from petroleum refineries if you see only Madras refinery limited is a plant from which elemental sulphur is recovered during refining of crude petroleum in Indian conditions. Right? And then production of byproduct sulphuric acid from zinc and copper smelters uh, is very common because sulphuric acid produced on large scales in this uh, smelting process. So, these are recovered as uh, byproducts and then used you know uh, and then subsequent purification of sulfuric acid is done and then sent to the consumer or utilized uh, in within the industry if it is required. Okay? Then production of sulfuric acid from pyrites. From the pyrites whatever the sulfuric acid is produced that is so large in volume that pyrites and phosphates chemicals limited plants what they have done? They have, you know, set up two plants for H2SO4 near Sindri for the uh, production of H2SO4 or for the recovery of H2SO4 uh, from these pyrates. Okay? So, these are the uh, three alternative process or, uh, you know, three alternative sources that are available for us to uh, either recover the elemental sulphur or directly produce the sulphuric acid. However, if you see more than 50 percent of uh, elemental sulphur available in world is produced by recovery of, uh, recovery of sulphur from the refinery gases or coke gases or something like this, industrial fuel gases. How? That is what we are going to see anyway uh, in subsequent slides. This is about the sources of uh, raw materials or alternative sources of uh, recovering elemental sulphur or sulphuric acid from the other plants and that is what we have seen. Now, let us discuss about the production of elemental sulphur. How many methods are there? Right? Primarily three methods are there. Elemental sulphur mining from salt domes. So, these are available or such processes are very uh, famous in America, Canada and some part of Europe. Then H2S conversion from natural gas and industrial gases or oxidation and reduction of H2S. Uh, this process is also very much famous in USA and Canada and then European countries. right? Then iron pyrates process which is very famous in India. Okay? So, now what we are going to see? We are going to see details of each of these three processes. Okay? So, you will be surprised to know that H2S conversion from natural gas to produce elemental sulphur is one of the important process because more than 50 percent of elemental sulphur that is available uh, in the world is produced by this process. What is this process? We have already uh, seen production of fuel gases and industrial gases. In majority of the flow sheets what you have seen uh, from the a reactor you are getting a different types of gases like CO, CO2, H2, H2S, etc. So, what we have done this H2S? We have absorbed this H2S by passing through that mixture of gases in a solution, something like ethanol amine solution. So, ethanol amine solution selectively absorb this H2S, the conditions are uh, operated such a way and then 
after absorption process what we do? We heat the solution, dilute solution, let us say ethanol amine which is absorbed, already absorbed H2S, then when you heat that ethanol amine dilute solution then H2S would be released from the solution almost in a pure form. That H2S you take and then do the oxidation and uh, in order to get the sulphur uh, dioxide which further react with the H2S to give elemental sulphur. So, that is uh, very common and then we know that most of the refinery process or uh, 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 so natural gases etc. this is there. So, then we can uh, we cannot actually from an industrial point of view also it is not uh, uh, advisable to leave it in the atmosphere. So, it has to be recovered. So, anyway we have to do we are doing recovering. So, then that recovered H2S can be further utilized to produce elemental sulphur. Okay? So, we are going to see these three process uh, for the production of elemental sulphur. So, let us start with elemental sulphur mining process which is also known as the fresh process. Raw materials, sulphur deposit in salt domes and then large supply of hot water is required because when you do the mining and then underground the mining wherever the uh, sulphur rocks are found, calcite, sulphur containing uh, rocks like calcite etc. are found. So, what you have to do? You have to uh, provide hot water to that area so that you know, so that the uh, rocks of sulphur you know uh, can be melted, can be melted in form of molten sulphur, and then that should be taken to the surface, ground surface for the further processing or you know, shipment etc. So, you need hot water, large supply of hot water. Quantitative requirements, let us say if you wanted to aim to produce 1 metric ton of sulphur, then hot water 6 tons is required that is how hot it is 160 degree centigrade minimum it should be there 160 to 180 degree centigrade something like that. Why? Because such hot water when, when it goes to, when you do the drilling or mining, when it goes to the uh, uh, sulphur containing rocks then it melts it melts the sulphur, elemental sulphur and then forms the molten sulphur. If that what is the melting point of the sulphur is uh, between 112 to 119 degree centigrade depending on what uh, crystal form it is having, right. So, obviously you have to provide a water which is uh, higher than the 112 degree centigrade and then once it is melting, so then that uh, elemental sulphur can be taken uh, to the surface. The process we are going to see anyway. Dome operating capacity is 500 to 8000 tons per day of sulphur. Okay. So, what is this process? First we see the description and then we see the same thing by uh, pictorial form also. Frash is a scientist who developed this method of melting the sulphur underground or under the sea and then pumping it up to the surface using a common oil well drilling equipment. How it is pictorially we are going to see anyway. Holes drilled to the bottom of sulphur bearing strata that is at a distance underground from 150 to 750 meters okay, from the surface if you drill up to minimum of 150 meters or to the maximum 750 meters then you may find this sulphur bearing strata. It depends on location to location, country to country. Okay. In this process three concentric pipes having diameter 3 to 20 centimeter to be specific 3 centimeter diameter pipe 1 and then 10 centimeter diameter pipe 1 and then 20 centimeter diameter pipe 1 are there. They are uh, arranged such a way that they form a 3 concentric pipes. Okay? It passes through the sulphur bearing stratum and rests on an upper portion of barren anhydrite. Then 10 centimeter pipe passes through 20 centimeter one so that to have an annular space and then annular space extends nearly to bottom of sulphur bearing rock and rest on a collar that seals the annular space between the pipes of uh, 10 centimeter diameter and 20 centimeter diameter. Then a pipe of 3 centimeter diameter inside the other pipes reaches to the depth slightly above the collar, this pipe is used to pass compressed air. Okay? 20 centimeter pipe is perforated at two different levels, one above and the other one below the annular collar. Purpose of upper set of perforation is to permit the hot water to escape 
whereas the molten sulfur enters the system through the lower perforations. The same thing if you see the pictorially fresh process this is what we are having, we are at the ground surface. Now if you drill below the ground surface, so up to 150 to 750 uh, meters uh, distance underground then what you have you may find sulfur bearing calcite or sulfur bearing rocks. Okay? So, this distance of drilling depends on the country, uh, you know, location to location. Some countries it may be available uh, in a near distance of 150 meters also. Some countries is, uh, you one has to drill up to 750 meters, right? So, then what you have? So, these uh, con three concentric pipes are there, right? So, we are having three pipes. One is this one having uh, 20 centimeter dia and then other one is uh, this one which is having 10 centimeters dia and then third one is this one which is having 3 centimeters dia, right? When you drill and then you pass the, uh, this 20 centimeter dia pipe goes in and then it rests on the surface here. Then the second pipe is uh, uh, which is having 10 centimeter dia that is uh, drilled so that it goes and then rest on a uh, sulfur bearing rock uh, and then it and the perforation is closed here. So then what happens? From here what you do uh, between the annular space of 20 centimeter to 10 centimeters uh, pipes you allow superheated water at 160 degree centigrade or sometimes 180 degree centigrade also at higher pressure like 25 atmospheres or something like that. So that it goes here and then moment it comes here it interacts with the this uh, whatever the uh, sulphur bearing rocks and then what happens this sulphur gets melted up because uh, the melting point of sulphur is between 112 to 119 degree centigrade. So then what happens uh, this molten sulphur it tries to pass through the space between 10 centimeters dia pipe to 3 centimeter dia pipe, right? And then it raises only to the uh, half of the distance, half of the height of these pipes because you know uh, the density of molten sulfur is greater than the density of water. So, the pressure that is exerted because of the hot water is only uh, is marginally sufficient to lift the molten sulphur to the half of this distance maybe up to this point or something like that. So, then further it has to go up to the ground surface then only you can recover. So, further for that purpose what you do? You send compressed hot air through the uh, 3 centimeter dia pipe. So, then when it goes here, so then what, what it does? It does it reduces the density of the molten sulphur so that its surface elevates further to the ground surface and then from here you collect the you collect the molten sulphur whatever you are looking for. So, this is the uh, uh, fresh process. Okay? So, this only mining part the entire flow sheet part we can take. So, then this uh, molten sulphur let us say if uh, there are uh, some impurities you can do the filtration etc. or directly you can take it to the uh, sulfur or molten st sulfur storage uh, uh, vessels or you can uh, take to the sulfur drying or um, you know for the drying of the molten sulfur so that you get the dry sulfur. For elemental molten sulfur recovery operation the hot water approximately 160 degree centigrade is passed down the annular space between 20 and 10 centimeter pipes. This hot water discharges through the perforation into the porous formation near the foot of the well. This hot water circulates around the sulphur bearing rock and raises to a temperature above the melting point of sulphur between 112 to 119 degree centigrade. Once it crosses the, uh, the temperature of the rocks, sulphur bearing rocks raises to the uh, more than 112 to 119 degree centigrade, the sulphur will melt. Since the molten sulphur is heavier than water, it sinks and forms a pool around the base of the well then it enters through the lower perforation and rises in the space between 10 centimeter and 3 centimeter pipes. 
molten sulfur is forced by pressure of water up to height of about half way to the surface only. Then compressed air is forced down the 3 centimeter pipe so that to aerate and reduce the density of liquid sulfur consequently making molten sulfur to raise to surface, ground surface. Now in this process two important things are there other than the drilling, one is the allowing the water, allowing the hot water to go into the uh, deeper level uh, almost up to the, uh, to the sulfur bearing rocks and then sending the compressed air. So at what rate should this uh, hot water should be sent? At what uh, rate this compressed air or what volume of the compressed air should be sent? This, these are the kind of engineering parameters one has to carefully calculate depending on the uh, uh, rocks, depending on the uh, distance at which rocks are available underground from the surface from the ground surface. So one has to be very careful in these calculations. So but basic principle what has to follow while doing this calculation that compressed air volume is regulated so that production rate is equalized with sulphur melting rate. This is in order not to deplete the sulphur pool and cause the well to produce water. If you send the uh, compressed air at a higher rate than the melting rate of the sulphur then what happens depletion of the sulphur will take place and then well start producing the water. You do not want, uh, you do not want that hot water to be getting onto the surface as your product that has to be taken a, in a different route. Okay? Then water must be withdrawn from formation at approximately same rates as it is injected. Let us say uh, 10 kg per hour. Uh, is the uh, water feed rate, hot water feed rate. So approximately at the same uh, rate you have to withdraw also. This withdrawal is to prevent build up of pressure of the point where further injection would be impossible. If you do not, uh, if you do not withdraw at the same level or the, at the same uh, mass rate or volumetric flow rate, then what happened? Because of this water, hot water pressure would be build up in the underground area and then the further injection of hot water may not be possible. So then if it is not possible, it will not be able to, uh, you know, you are not able to uh, take the sulphur out effic efficiently. Bleed wells for extracting water from the perforation usually are located on deeper flanks of the dome to withdraw the heavier cold water which accumulates there. Amount of water required to produce one ton of sulphur depends on the richness of deposits and other factors obviously. So you one has to be careful about how much sulphur is available underground accordingly one has to calculate uh, re water requirement, uh, water requirement obviously. Okay? Liquid sulphur moves through steam heated lines to separator where air is removed. The product liquid sulphur after removing air can either be solidified in large storage vats or kept in liquid form in steam jacketed store, storage tanks either way. If there are some uh, carbonaceous or mineral matter present in the molten sulphur, then what you do? You can do filtration process to remove those contaminants. So now if this entire process, if you see in a flow chart form, what you have? You have, you know, this is what you have. Okay? So what you have here? So this is the uh, drilling equipment, drilling pot or fresh process, whatever we have seen here in the previous uh, things and then rest other things are you know uh, to complete the flow sheet. So now here this is uh, uh, you know 20 centimeters uh, dia pipe and this is 10 centimeters dia pipe and this is 3 centimeters dia pipe. Okay? The concentric space uh, between uh, 20 and 10 centimeters dia area is used for pumping the hot water which is at around 160 to 180 degrees centigrade and then pressure at which this is allowed is approximately 25 atmosphere. It reaches the uh, bottom uh, area where the sulphur uh, containing uh, rocks are present. So then when this hot water comes here, so whatever the sulphur rocks are there, uh, you know, the temperature here gradually raises and then once the temperature raises to 112 to 119 degrees centigrade, it start melting. Once it is start melting, it will uh, pass through the space between 10 centimeter and then 3 centimeter pipe diameter between the space of uh, two pipes having 10 centimeter and then 3 centimeter diameters. 
right? But the hot water pressure is created that much that it can force the molten sulfur approximately about half of the half the way of uh, you know this distance whatever uh, to the surface distance, right? So then what you have to do? You have to give compressed air from the 3 centimeter dia pipe. So then when the compressed air comes in, it reduces the density of the sulfur so that the sulfur further raises to the surface and then that can be collected in a sump phase separator. Whatever the bleed water uh, to well is there that can be recovered from the bottom here from here itself and then aerators can be used and then after that one waste water or contains scale forming salt and H2S whatever are there so they can be separated out. So now you can understand the same water you cannot reuse that is the reason treated water whatever is there its requirement is very large in this process that is one of the engineering problem right. So this treated water is sent to the well around at 160 to 180 degrees centigrade and 25 atmosphere. Okay. So now whatever the uh, molten sulfur you got on the surface, if it is not having any impurities then you can take uh, to the molten sulfur storage if you wanted to store in the uh, uh, liquid form where uh, you know the steam heated uh, containers are uh, used for the storing in uh, liquid form. If you wanted to do the uh, if you wanted to do the solidification it can be taken after solidification it can be taken to the solidification vats having the capacity of uh, 1 lakh to 5 lakhs tons and then from there to shipment etc it can be done. Let us say if there are uh, let us say if the molten sulphur is having some kind of impurities so then you can opt for the pressure filtration process in order to remove this uh, carbonaceous or mineral impurities that are present in the molten sulphur. This is the process, okay. This is the uh, elemental sulphur recovery process from the salt domes. If you see the major engineering problems, obviously what you understand the heat transfer rate. Heat transfer rate is very essential not only in the drilling area but also in the uh, you know uh, shipping operation also. Because the drilling area, because the sulphur uh, rocks are there at different levels in different locations. Some are at just 150 meters distance, some are even up to 700-750 meters you have to drill. So then obviously heat transfer calculations are going to be affected by the distance. So the controlling heat transfer rate not only in the melting operation but also in shipping operations is one of the important uh, engineering problem that one should be concerned about. Because of presence of this H2S and then flakes forming salts etc. in the recovered water, the same cannot be used further. Uh, as a treated water for the process, okay? that is the reason requirement of treated water is very large. So that is one important challenge. So another one is that because of nature of mining obviously corrosion of equipment and then pipeline is going to be taking place and then avoiding or reducing such cor corrosion is another important uh, challenge from the chemical engineers point of view. So next process is elemental S by oxidation and reduction of H2S process. Chemical reactions if you see H2S reacting with the oxygen to give sulphur dioxide and then water. The sulphur dioxide may be further oxidized to give uh, sulphur trioxide and then uh, when the sulphur trioxide dissolved into water one can get the uh, you know sulfuric acid. But what happens uh, the reactions are conditions such a way that in this process this SO2 sulphur dioxide further react with the hydrogen sulphide H2S to give the elemental sulphur when appropriate catalyst uh, is being used Al2O3 or Fe2O3 sometimes iron catalysts are also used. Okay? And then what you see these reactions are exothermic because enthalpy of the reactants is higher than the enthalpy of the products, so that is another issue. Okay? So now raw materials, obviously what you see H2S is the raw material, one of the raw material along with the air, and air or oxygen. Okay? So this H2S from where are we getting? We get uh, from natural sour gases or petroleum refinery streams or in the production of uh, you know, uh, you know, producer gas, coke oven gas, etc. All these uh, fuel uh, gases production, what we have seen, we have seen H2S, right? 
in such processes this H2S is impurity, so it has to be uh, removed, right? After removing because of the uh, pollution concern, you cannot uh, discard it into the environment. So, it has to be uh, properly recovered and then subsequent chemical operation one has to do. So, what we do? We uh, what we have seen in uh, production of uh, fuel gases section, the mixture of gases passes through ethanol amine or potassium carbonate solutions, so that this H2S is being absorbed by these solutions. One whatever once this H2S is absorbed, so then uh, remaining gases, whatever the purified gases or gases free from H2S are taken from the uh, taken for the subsequent processes. But whatever this dilute uh, solution is there, it is heated up to elevate a temperature to release or uh, relieve almost pure H2S. This is what we have seen. And then once it is released, pure almost pure solution is again reused for absorbing additional uh, H2S from the incoming mixture gases again. So, this is what we have seen in the production of uh, fuel gases section previously in last couple of weeks. Okay, several times we have seen. So, this uh, recovered H2S can be used as a uh, you know source for production of elemental sulfur by this process. Okay. Recovered by scrubbing with ethanol amines and high temperature stripping one can get the H2S and then that can be oxidized to get required elemental sulfur as per the reactions A and B. Right. Quantitative requirements if you see let us say if you wanted to produce 1 metric ton of sulfur at 100 percent yield, then 1.2 tons of H2S is required and then air 1700 normal cubic meters are required. Plant capacities is usually low 20 to 600 tons per day. Process description if you see large volumes of H2S is being removed during purification of sour, natural gas, coke oven gas and uh, from petroleum refinery gas. It is recovered by dissolving the H2S uh, rich vent gases in potassium carbonate solution or ethanol amine solution followed by heating to regenerate almost pure H2S, right? So, once you remove the H2S from the solution, that solution can be reused for absorbing more uh, H2S from the incoming mixed gases, okay? Thus produced H2S is burned to give sulphur dioxide for sulfuric acid production, but majority is converted to elemental S by various modifications of original, original class process as per reactions A and B that we have seen in the previous slide. This H2S uh, when oxidized it gives sulphur dioxide. So, this sulphur dioxide further react with the H2S to give the elemental sulphur this is what we have seen, right? So, recovery of sulphur components from the fuel and industrial gases is also required from the pollution regulations viewpoint as well. Thus, several processes developed and approximately one half of the world production of elemental sulphur is made by gas treatment because many countries are not having uh, sources, natural resources of uh, this uh, sulphur containing salt domes, etc. So, then they are depending on this gas treatment process to get this elemental sulphur. Other sources of sulphur include coke oven gas and synthetic crude oils from tar sands or shale oils. It was also available previously uh, from coal, but nowadays only uh, very little sulphur is presently recovered from the coal. So, the recovery of molten sulphur or elemental sulphur from H2S by this process is having you know uh, two step reactions. So, what are these two steps that we are going to see now through these flow sheets. Now, the almost pure H2S recovered from the petroleum refineries etc. or uh, while production of uh, fuel gas etc. whatever the H2S almost pure H2S that recovered that along with the air you pass through a furnace which is uh, you know uh, maintained by the uh, uh, this furnace is nothing but steam heated furnace, right? So, you depending on the economics different types of furnace can also be utilized anyway. So, once this H2S and the air pass through furnace obviously oxidation of uh, H2S takes place and then SO2 water forms. There may be some impurities 
of H2S as because of unreacted H2S as well as air would be there. The products coming from this furnace would be at certain temperature like 300 degree centigrade and then this gaseous mixture is sent to first reactor where bauxite catalyst is used. Catalyst is also an option here. So, Al2O13 can, can also be used, Fe2O3 can also be used uh, by different processes, different these things catalyst are used. For this reaction, uh, first step reaction to take place here uh, or the, for this uh, conversion of SO2 to sulphur or elemental sulphur, more air is required let us say in case then secondary air can also be sent. So, the product that is coming out from the reactor is at 400 degree centigrade and then conversion is 70 to 80 percent only. This mixture what you do? You pass through a condenser, right? And then uh, in the condenser uh, the H2O is sprayed so that the temperature reduces to 150 degree centigrade whatever the molten sulphur is there that can be taken to the sump, right? So, but however, if you wanted to increase the conversion, so then uh, temperature reduced gases are sent back to the, uh, are sent to the another reactor, second reactor which is operating around 250 to uh, 300 degree centigrade. So, he, again here now the further conversion takes place and then uh, uh, the yield is going to be increased, right? So, then this from this reactor whatever the effluents are coming, so they are taken to the another condenser where again water is uh, sprayed and then temperature is reduced to 150 degree centigrade and then molten sulphur is taken to the sumps. Right. Whatever the waste gases are there, they are scrubbed in a scrubber using the molten sulphur before taking out the waste gases because waste gases may also contain this elemental sulphur because this elemental sulphur in this process whatever is there that is S6 we are getting that we get in the gases form as per the reaction that we have seen. So, you do not want any sulphur gases to uh, pass through along with the waste gases. So, then before uh, taking off the waste gases, those waste gases has to be processed through a scrubber where molten sulphur is used to absorb the elemental S6 gases, right? So, uh, actually these reactors are inbuilt with uh, internal condensing and cooling options, but however, for the easier understanding they are shown like this, okay? So, now the uh, products from the condenser are taken to the sump, right? From here molten sulphur can be taken to the scrubber so that to uh, recover a more S6 from the waste gases before releasing the waste gases to the vent, okay? Once the S6 is also absorbed on this uh, scrubber, so they will, back, they will be taken back to the sump again. And then if you wanted to uh, do the uh, solidification, this molten sulphur tank would be taken to the such respective units or if you wanted to store it in a molten sulphur form, then they will be taken to a molten sulphur uh, container which is steam heated uh, equipment, okay? By this process here because of these two reaction, uh, because of the two reactors using the yield is 90 to 95 percent, okay? So, if you recapitalize uh, what we have seen elemental sulphur recovery by uh, oxidation of H2S process, H2S and air burned as per reactions, this one first reaction A and then this SO2 further oxidizes H2S by this reaction to give elemental sulphur uh, S6 in gaseous form. For above reaction two stage catalytic converter with intercooling and condensing provisions are often used. Final waste gas is scrubbed with molten sulphur. Then engineering problems, two stage reactor design for exothermic SO2 oxidation of H2S is uh, very much uh, challenging problem. 70 to 80 percent conversion in first stage occurs at around 300 to 400 degree centigrade followed by 250 to 300 degree centigrade operation in the second reactor to obtain favorable equilibrium. This is one important challenge accordingly one has to do the calculations. Then heat exchange for molten sulphur handling is another problem. Then obviously corrosion of equipments uh, wherever this kind of equipment uh, uh, components like sulphur, sulfuric acids are there, so corrosion is very big problem. Then final cleanup of stake gases is another engineering problem one has to take care. Coming to the references, 
for this lecture are provided here, but however, all these details can be found in these two references. Thank you. Thank you.